everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Restored to More. We are so excited for you guys to listen to our guest today, Dr. Clifford and Joyce Penner. Joyce is a registered nurse and a clinical nurse specialist. She also holds a BS in nursing from the University of Washington and has a master's degree in psychosomatic nursing and nursing education from UCLA. Dr. Clifford is a licensed clinical psychologist, has a BA from Bethel College, and holds a master's in theology from Fuller Theological Seminary. He also received his PhD from Fuller's Graduate School of Psychology. The Penners are best known for, for their pioneer work in encouraging people of all faiths to connect their sexuality with their belief system, helping them embrace sex as good and of God. They work together as a team offering counseling with individuals and couples, teaching sex education within various school systems, leading sexual enhancement weekends for couples, lecturing on human sexuality at universities, and training fellow professionals. Welcome, Dr. Clifford and Joyce Penner. We are so excited to have you on the show today. Well, this is fun, very fun. Yeah, we are, Thank you. we really enjoy this kind of thing, especially since we're talking massive differences in generations here. Yeah. <laughs> you're young. You guys know you have a couple years on us. Not much though, just a couple <laughs> years, huh? Yeah, yeah, just a few. And I think God's going to freeze your age just right now at this time, because we need yes. you more than ever in the next generations to come. <laughs> so I think you're just going to stay right there. Yeah. <laughs> right, here, right here forever. Well, I, I'd love to start by just hearing a little bit of your guys' background. Before we dive into your well of wisdom and hear all you have to say, can you tell us how you guys came to talk about making, talking about sex, your full-time gig? How did that come about? It, it certainly was not our intention and clearly a calling from God. We didn't have right in our high school yearbooks that we were going to grow up to be sex therapists. <laughs> that, that was for sure. Lesson we hardly knew what sex was when we graduated from high school, let alone what sex therapists because were. Because we were both raised in Mennonite churches. Sure. So it was very conservative, very, very loving and caring families and very involved in, in our our church life and our faith and all of that, but uh, the you know, whole subject of sex was not talked about. It was totally silent. It wasn't like there we got any bad messages. We didn't get any messages. Sure. So we were like empty slates. And I think that's probably why God chose us for this. Mm. And, it and we met when I was 18, Joyce was 17. We were just freshmen in, in college. We met each other a long time. And uh, and dated four years. And then right before we got married, Joyce uh, was finishing her nurse's training and had a, a, a course on sexuality. Yes. In fact, this nursing program in St. Paul, Minnesota hired a clinical psychologist nurse, I mean, clinical psychologist woman, strong believer to teach us about sex and marriage because so many of us in the class, it was a small class, were engaged to be married that summer. And she, this is 1963, and it's amazing her knowledge and information that she imparted at that time. Hmm. Our sexuality as believers made all the difference because when wow. I got home three weeks before the wedding, I just finished this class and was so excited to get married hmm. and be able to have sex. And my mom took me aside and said, she never talked about it before and basically gave me three warnings. The honeymoon will be awful. You'll be very tired and don't let him use you. Well, wow. having had this class. What a pep talk. <laughs> yes. yes. What, man, that, make, that would make nobody excited. You're like, oh my gosh, this is going to be horrible. And so she didn't obey. In fact, I was, I was out to prove. I she didn't was use wrong. her. She used me and I was <laughs> tired. <laughs> I was so mad because, and I just think of what if this woman hadn't come to teach that yeah. we would be in a totally different place it would have scared me I would have been gone in totally different than I did so we really believe and then because we were raised Mennonites and hadn't been taught anything we spent the first year of our devotional time as a couple just going through scripture from the beginning, finding any passage we could about sex and trying to figure out what God really meant about sex. Again, wow. never did we know that we'd be teaching others. We were just trying to figure out for ourselves. We were enjoying it and thinking, should we really be enjoying it? Cliff says he never thought that, but I was thinking. Should we? 
And uh, and then we both went on and got our education, uh, you know, all the school that you talked about and all that stuff. So that was a, took a while. Uh, and I always told our kids growing up, just prepare for what God you think God is calling you to, because yeah. you never know. Because when I studied psychosomatic nursing at UCLA, I was going to teach it, not, and I was in sex education, I mean, in nursing education for eight years. Yeah, Joyce taught at the university for eight years wow. in nursing while I was getting my degree. And wow. then I was in a private practice in Pasadena and was asked to teach a group of 60 women about sex that were seminary students wow. live. And because they were all women, I prevailed upon Joyce to come with me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. A, a professor. And, and I was just a psychologist. And, and we just studied. This was a weekly class for 10 weeks, two hours every Wednesday evening. And we knew nothing. And wow. we just gathered all the literature and everything we could find. In those days, you couldn't find it on a computer. You had to go to a library. Sure. <laughs> I don't know if you guys even know what that is. No, that's, we don't. That's what it looks the, like right behind us. Oh, OK. Have, I, 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 I'm going to take a picture of that later and put that on yeah, yeah. Know, the web or something. So what I hear you guys saying is, this began as a journey for your own yes. healthy sexuality in marriage. You wanted yes. to go, hey, we're enjoying sex from Joyce. Are we supposed to enjoy sex? Cliff is going, Joyce, don't, don't test that. This is a good thing. Let's not stop a good thing here. But let's find out why it's so good and why is it so skewed? And I think you'd agree that our culture has yes. tried to skew this upside down, backwards. We've used it for marketing tactics. We, we, we warn kids. The church never talks about i mean how often do you hear sex talk from a pulpit it's always the verses that it's bad you know abstain from sexual immorality and impurities it, we hardly ever talk about this so i would love to hear just how much you've seen the, the people embrace your teaching and what you've seen your teachings do over the years yes it definitely and unfortunately when we get those messages in church that we're supposed to save it for set for marriage no one says and it's supposed to be good in marriage mm. that so then so many couples we see in our practice are young couples who shut down on their sexuality in order to control their actions rather than making decisions about their action and keeping their sexuality alive mm. wow. because they don't know how to separate because and they get the idea that the way the world does it must be the only way for it to be good sure and so then we have marriages that are supposed to be, and God so highly values sex and marriage that he uses it throughout scripture to teach us how he wants to relate to us. Because mm. it's in sex, we most lose ourselves with another person. And that's how he wants us to lose ourselves with him. Just and like I, he I would just say to get specific about your question, that that we have actually been very well received wherever yes. we go. Um, I, I think eager. partly because of the background we come from, partly because we're educated, partly because we don't uh, make it racy uh, or questionable, um, but, but we are definitely in favor of it. Like we write in our first book, The Gift of Sex, which is now out for 40 years, if you can believe well, that. We did rewrite it somewhere yeah. along there, but... Uh, Yes, it is so important mm. that that message comes across and it has made a major difference. I love that. Charity talked earlier about that book making a humongous impact in our relationship. And, and then we've recommended that book to countless people. Um, Charity's therapist is a huge fan of you guys, as we told you off air. And, uh, and it, your teachings have really revolutionized our bedroom. So thank you so much because... Well, and what's been what's been interesting is that that has taken us all over the the Christian world, wow. Europe, Asia, mm -hmm. uh, everywhere, where we teach what not only married couples but a lot of Christian counselors around the world. And so, mm -hmm. um, it it really has been exciting, but never something we planned. Well, and I think what Cliff mentioned is we don't have to be kinky in order to mm -hmm. teach it yeah. as a wholesome thing. We're just yeah. matter of fact, and yeah. Sometimes I think um, to teach sexuality, specialists think they have to be off, kind of off guard, yeah. or, like make it to make it interesting. And you really yeah. don't have to. You just have to teach the truth. 
You know, we look back at our lives and we wish so bad that we had people like you in our lives in our junior high and high school years, because, you know, and, and you guys talk about this, right? Uh, I was so excited to bring this up in our conversation, but our four-year-old had an erection a few days ago and he couldn't take a nap, right? He was laying down and he said, my mommy, I can't sleep. And Cher said, why not? He goes, look at my peepee. And the peepee is pointing straight up, you know? And, <laughs> and, and so, and what we have learned from your books and other podcasts and teachings is, is just to remove shame from that conversation right. and normalize it and talk about it and use the, the actual scientific terminology for those things. And we're able to have wholesome, healthy conversations around that. But that would have right. never happened if people like yourselves hadn't said, you know what, we're going to talk about this in a matter of fact way, in a healthy way, because that helps us talk to our children in a way that we know will be transformational. Because you're right, the, the only message that we received as kids, or at least that I received, was that sex is awesome in pornography, because mm -hmm. the girl enjoys herself, the man's excited about it. And then the church talks about sex being bad. And so, mm -hmm. and that was the message I got. Sex is actually only fun when it's dangerous or when it's, yeah. when it's forbidden, it's the forbidden fruit. And, and that, and I love that you guys are changing that topic and you're changing that message. Yes, for sure. And we hope that is worldwide. I would love to ask you guys this question because I think what leads to that is that there's just an, a lack of education of awareness that women um, were designed for sex too, right? I think there's a lot of talk of men are horny and um, you know, men are just wired that <laughs> yeah, way. Totally. We're just wired that way, you know, and you hear that over and over and over again in messages and the way that people talk. And so I would love for you guys to talk about how women were designed for sex and how we get aroused too. Right. And the little story you told about your four-year-old son is one of the reasons why women aren't as aware of their sexuality as men are, because it's right there out in front of them from age two and on. Yeah. And for us, it's much more internal and we're not as visually aware of it. And then Typically, the church has given either subtly or directly the message that the woman's role is to keep the husband at home and happy, not that it is part of her job. The, the last book that we wrote uh, is called Enjoy, the Gift of Sexual Pleasure for Women. And the whole point of that book is to help women get be aware of and get in touch with their own sexual feelings to know that it is for them, not just them pleasing the man. I mean, yeah, and that's the way man. God designed us, even though it isn't as overt and obvious. It is very intense and very complex and even so much more complex than the male is. So it, it is important. In fact, we always kiddingly say the model, you know. She was created after. <laughs> the man the man is kind of your basic stick shift Chevy pickup truck and a woman is a Maserati that takes, <laughs> they really when they're humming they're really humming but but it takes a lot to keep them in shape you know they spend a lot of time in the shop <laughs> and that's what it takes for a man to do with the woman I love that and with the all you, gotta, so would, all you gotta do is push us and we get started. You just gotta give a little push and we're off, we're off to the races. That's right. That's we gotta right. really we gotta really keep everything up and running. I love that analogy. That is funny. Husbands have a lot harder job because you gotta fine tune, you've got to get fine-tuned before we're up and running. Well, and then the, the, the trick is that, that a woman is never the same from one day to the next. So what really was good yesterday may not be all that great today. And men sure. like to have a formula and get it down. And here are the five steps and we to keep, great lovemaking. We mm -hmm. keep it interesting by always changing. <laughs> well, let's, I, 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 yeah, I, I appreciate you saying that because that's something that even, I mean, I love, okay, so what you're going to learn about Charity and I is we are some of the most honest and transparent people on this podcast because I think that's what we, are, we need in our life is we need people in our life that are transparent and honest. And that's something yeah. that we've battled, right? We've battled, you know, trying to make it creative. Now, again, our situation is a little different because- I have in my history an addictive addiction to pornography. Mm -hmm. And so when there's sexual brokenness there, I think it makes sex harder. And I wanted to ask you guys about this. You know, when mm -hmm. so a lot of the people that are listening to our podcast are coming from some kind of a sexual brokenness in their past, how can they take maybe baby steps to 
maybe rewiring their brain on the topic of sex in the bedroom and and what's the best way for them to start learning about it obviously your books are amazing mention a few of those where should they start with the resource you guys have created well we would recommend first of all whichever resource they use and we'll mention different ones for different situations but that they read it out loud together i don't know whether the two of you have done that but the rewiring works a lot better. And that is the way we talk about it. The sex and the brain research, which has come out since Cliff and I have been teaching this for years, has been a wonderful uh, discovery because it affirms what we've been teaching from a biblical perspective, what we've learned about sex and the brain and how it works. And how we first get started with sex, like let's use your pornography example, we get hooked on that first trial learning it's called. And then it's very difficult. You have to recondition your brain to respond to it because pornography isn't about intimacy. You know, scripture talks about becoming one. Pornography, you don't have to connect with that person at all. All it's doing is triggering your physical response. Yeah, because when, when it's just focused on the erotic, which is what pornography is about, then um, it can be exciting, but it doesn't have anything to do with a relationship. And so if we're going to have a relationship, we have to be focused on the mutual pleasure between us rather than just what I, the man, or if the woman is into pornography, what she's getting from it. And when we first started teaching about this, it was rare to have women be into pornography. I remember us doing a cup podcast or something like that I think it was podcasts in those days and one woman responded with a question during the time saying what if I'm the woman with this issue and that was the first time we had heard a woman say now obviously still men are much higher percentage but women get hooked on yeah. it too a little yeah. differently so yeah. to answer your question directly how do we break into it first of all it has to be owned by the by the person who's dealing with it they've got to acknowledge it and often that only happens when they get busted uh the the wife walks in or the boss walks in or the children walk in or something is discovered uh and and once it is owned and faced then that usually gets broken into only because they're willing to get some kind of therapy help and be in some kind of an accountability relationship with somebody yeah. other than their spouse but let's that talk they're about accountable the rewiring to. and the so, rewiring yeah. is so let's say they've done that right they've done that work and so now you have a couple that is in recovery together they're admitting help they they've, mm -hmm. they've done those things you recommended which are fantastic things we talk a lot about those and now they're in a place where as a couple they're going okay here's the deal our bedroom and our and i mean i say bedroom meaning our sex life yeah. is broken yeah. our sex mm -hmm. life is broken and they're they're looking at the, at this podcast they're looking yeah. at you guys going where can we start yeah, so we want to talk there about the rewiring or the reconditioning. And our book, The Restoring the Pleasure, we have a sexual retraining program, which, which is basically exactly what we do in sex therapy. And many couples can work through this on their own. And what that basically does is we start them right at the beginning where they're not even having any sexual intercourse. They're just gradually taking step by step. There are 30 steps. Um, that take them from basically hand-holding to sexual intercourse and dealing with whatever barriers surface as they take the next step. And barriers will surface. But again, back to what's interesting, we designed those steps. We've modified them and enhanced them before the sex and the brain research came out to say that the kind of uh, response that happens when you watch pornography or when it's triggered in a new relationship, like an affair, is triggered by dopamine in the brain. And that's, they're also in a new sexual relationship when we first get married, all that kind Dr. of thing. Dr. Alan Shore out of UCLA calls that excited love. Mm. But to have last a lifetime, 57 years we've been married, uh, that requires oxytocin in the brain, which is what the restoring the pleasure exercises help you build it. That's about intimacy and connection. It's when 
you have an infant, a baby, and you want to look in their eyes and hold them close and hug, and let them feel skin to skin, to bond with you, to attach. That's what has to happen. And Dr. Shore calls that quiet love mm. over against excited love. The quiet love that it grows out of commitment, grows out of intimacy, grows out of connection, rather than just out of the erotic. Because you can yeah. get aroused without knowing the person's name. Yeah. So tell me if I'm wrong here, Chair, but but I think what we deal with, with couples who've gone through betrayal and whether it be pornography or infidelity or an outside affair, what's happening most of the time is the guy is looking for this kind of sex that's more transactional. And the woman yes. feels betrayed because she knows that as he enters into a sexual relationship with her, it is a transaction versus an, uh, the epitome of intimacy, like we talked about. Is yes. that right? And so even in our relationship, as I was doing pornography, you felt that there we were lacking that love that we, you were talking about based off the connection that we had. Is that correct? Totally. And, I think and that is true. And I think what you guys are saying too is oxytocin makes you feel safe again. Because yes. we know that trust. betrayal, you know, and, and pornography and infidelity and affairs, all that just makes you feel unsafe. So mm -hmm. all the, the betrayed person wants is to feel safe again. And so what I'm hearing is that these little baby steps are going to create safety again for her, or maybe it's him. And, you know, it's going to help them um, reunite that sexuality rather than just like, boom, going into sex right away. Right. Yeah. And, and what's often hard for, let's say the husband uh, is the one that, that was hooked on whatever it was he was hooked on. The husband often feels like, okay, can't you get over it? I said, I'm sorry. Um, let's, let's move on. And, and the re reality yes, is that, that the husband is going to have to be caring and thoughtful. And when he leaves for the hardware store for half an hour and doesn't come back for two hours, he has to call and say, hey, I'm, I, I, I stopped at the hardware store, they didn't have it, so I've got to go to another town to get it or whatever it is. He's got to be accountable far beyond what he wants to. <laughs> yeah. He gets frustrated that she's not trusting him yet. Yeah. And yet it takes a, a long time. The way we often talk about it is when you're in a marriage, you, you build up your trust account. And it grows and grows and grows. And then like when your bank account. like your bank account. And then when there's unfaithfulness or porn or whatever, it goes to zero. Mm. Isn't just like the top, you, you, you lose the top 20% because stock market went down a little. No, it crashed. It's gone. And so then you have to start rebuilding the trust. But with each time that that happens, the rebuilding of the trust is harder. Mm. And so it it's takes broken. longer. And uh, so we really want to encourage husbands to really be aware that they're going to, it might be a couple of years until the trust is rebuilt. The other thing that sometimes and often happens is that the husband wants the woman to do what he saw in the porn. And then she feels like an object rather than that he's relating to her because yeah. he thinks, well, and this often happens even before he's admitted the porn. But when we get questions about he wants me to do this and this in the bedroom, I say, is he watching porn? Yep. Because usually when you're in an intimate relationship, we didn't know about porn. We discovered together and grew together. But he's got this whole visual package in his mind that he thinks sex should be like that. And if yeah. she just did a dance for him or strip tease or whatever he has on his list, then it would be as good for her as it is for him. Really appreciate you guys sharing that. There's a lot of wisdom there. And I think what we, what I hear is that guys have to be patient, right? Especially after betrayal has taken place. And this is why it's so important for us to work our programs because yeah. it doesn't matter if we have been sober for six months or a year or two years, if there is repeated activity again, that that trust account just got depleted it is now at yep. zero all over again we right. can't be frustrated that oh well i had two years i didn't mess up or whatever it's like right. no exactly. we just took it down to zero again and right. there's also hope that we can rebuild that trust account by doing those baby steps and that will build trust that gets the dopamine uh, the dopamine's there but that also gets the oxytocin going and the oxytocin 
is where we're talking about the relationship forming, the safety forming, and that's going to lead to an enjoyable sex life with our spouses is what I hear you say. Exactly. Yeah. Much better long-term because the other won't last. The other, you have to keep changing. Yeah. Because it doesn't, you know, you won't be happy with the same porn picture again and again and again. You always will need something new or the man who yeah. has affairs will have to find somebody else. I wanted to go back to the issue of around women and their, their gift of, of pleasure. Please. Uh, because uh, we talk about that a lot in the book Enjoy. And the parallel book to that is The Married Guy's Guide to Great Sex. Uh, those are kind of one for the woman, one for the man. But we always encourage you to read them out loud with each other. And, uh, and then what, why that helps, I'm just going to inject something here, is when we read it out loud, and for couples who maybe aren't where they can have find a sex therapist, and now you can do things virtually and things like that, but maybe they can't afford it. It's a lot more expensive than a book, let me tell you. <laughs> Starting at least by reading out loud together and seeing whether you can work on it by yourselves is a great place to start. And the book almost serves like a therapist, like that third party because you can read the words and you know the words weren't written specifically for you, but may, man, they may feel like, you know, they must've known us because they wrote that. <laughs> and sometimes you can feel accused by us. We've had men call and say, you know, like they're yelling at us for having told them that. I said, we didn't know you. <laughs> <laughs> but in the Married Guys Guide, we talk about how the husband's role is a lot harder than that of the woman's because he is called in scripture especially in ephesians 5 to love the wife sexually like christ loves the church which means and christ loved the, the church and the world by giving up himself mm -hmm. his rights to take care of us where we are and to love us exactly as we are we don't have to go through a whole bunch of gymnastics and become the person that he, Christ wants us to be in order to him to accept us. He accepts us as we are. Then we gives us ways to grow to become more like him. But the same thing has to happen for the husband to love his wife where she is. And she may not be, she may be broken and wounded. She may have had sexual trauma or been raised in an alcoholic home or all kinds of things that could affect her ability to let go and enjoy sexually. Yeah, in fact, it might be just good to say a word about that. When there has been some kind of trauma in the past for the woman, especially like molestation or incest or some kind of abuse or some kind of violation, it is going to take a while for the woman to be able to move past that. And this calls on the husband to be very loving, caring and, and safe with her in that process. And that's a giant subject, but we just want to throw that out there because a lot of women, after they get married, lose their sexual desire. And, and much of the time that has to do with having had some kind of violation in the past. Mm -hmm. And I think you guys know stats even better than we do, but mm -hmm. we have been, we've been doing research and it's like so many women have felt violated or betrayed in yes. some way sexually. I mean, all of us have some kind of a sexual brokenness. I believe whether it was us personally or our parents or our brothers right. or sisters or a, a, somebody close to us. Well, and I actually heard you guys um, do another interview on a podcast and you guys even had mentioned that um, growing up in an alcoholic family um, yes. can also um, trigger you to, you know, not want mm. to be vulnerable because it, it, it makes you feel lack of control. So, mm -hmm. and I had never even, I mean, I never even thought of that before and wow. how that could relate. Can yes. you guys talk about that a little bit? Yes, definitely. When, if our home growing up was emotionally out of control, either because of an alcoholic parent or a mentally ill parent or, or, or a rageaholic. A violence verbally or physically. Anything where we felt we had to internalize the need for control too young. Because kids are supposed to be able to bounce off solid walls that we provide for them. We provide the boundaries and the clear clarity of the rules of the house, whatever it is, how we do that. And if, if it's all out of control, and sometimes we find this is even like in the 60s and 70s, when 
the parents were in this free sex era and they thought everything should be out and open and we should have dinner in the nude one night a week or something like that or the kid the girl is in her adolescent pre-adolescent years and dad decides they shouldn't be in the bathroom with the door with closed. the door closed that, door. any kind of violation like that and has it, the effect of making the woman especially close up man, yeah and and not be liking that feeling of getting out of control but then when they find the arousal is there from the physical arousal and they get out of control may have an intense orgasm and then drop off and then they're disinterested again because they don't like that feeling of being sure. out of control so they can be out of control they could be very responsive and they even internally desire sex but they resist that desire they shut it off because it feels unsafe to them and we see this most commonly when raised in an alcoholic home but any other kind of out of control home emotionally yeah. wow so insightful mm -hmm. so good for people to realize and and i think there's so much is that which is very confusing for the guy because we are you know in sex we're working hard to make sure that it's there's a mutual benefit we're both orgasming in the relationship in sex and you have this great experience and then you don't want to do it anymore and we're like yeah what in the world was that about? What happened there? I thought I was doing a good job, huh? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. And it doesn't have anything to do with the, doing a good job or not having done a good job. It has to do with the barriers that the woman brings, using that example, into the marriage. Yeah. Right. So. And that is uh, one of the things we wanted to talk about today was how can you educate to what does that look like to have a healthy sexuality and Please. we believe would it would be ideal if each person could bring healthy sexuality into marriage not a reality but an ideal and that's why we wrote our book getting your sex life off to a great start getting your sex life off to a great start because and this is for engaged couples yeah and we clearly that's when we recommend they read out loud together and work through it together and couples will say, well, you know, that we're waiting for marriage to have sex. Should we read that before? Shouldn't we wait till after? And we say, if you can't control yourself, sit in your parents' living room when everybody's walking around and read <laughs> or go to the park and read where the kids are playing on the park bench and read there. You know, if, it, if it's too hard to read and not control your actions, then read it somewhere where you're, you have to be in control. But, there's but the extra whole point is to open up the subject so that there's a natural flow about it because our, our main theme for us is that if it's going to be good for a lifetime it has to be mutually good in in first corinthians chapter 7 paul talks about that very clearly when he says you know the marriage bed has to be a place of mutuality the wife but satisfying the husband the husband satisfying the wife and uh, it's not that the whole place. idea of mutuality mm -hmm. It's not the place to stand up for your rights. It's the place to serve the other, whether in bed or out. And uh, to do that, you have to do some work ahead of time for it to be mutual. And in our book, Getting Your Sex Life Out to a Great Start, the first thing we deal with is having the couple think through what myths or misunderstandings or misinformation they might bring to their sexual relationship and talk about that. And then get to know themselves sexually. What are they bringing? What have they experienced in the past? What did they learn about sex? And then get to know each other by sharing that what they brought with each other. And then clarifying their expectations. One of the big things we find is we come to sex with different expectations, whether it's what will happen on the honeymoon, whether it's what will happen in the first year. You know, I thought we were going to have sex three times a day, uh, <laughs> well, seven days a week. Play in bed all day long, and we're not going to go and see the Paris, you know, <laughs> Notre Dame or whatever it is. <laughs> I yes. love that, you guys. That's and that's so important. I mean, what we're talking about is revolutionary because mm -hmm. it's a topic that, if you're raised in the church, it doesn't get talked about. Period, unless it has a negative connotation. And what you're doing is we're going, hey, let's talk about this. Let's get this openly communicated. Let's talk about expectations. Let's talk about what, what baggage or burdens we bring to into marriage, into the, into the marriage bed. 
And and that's so important. I just I'm 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 not just like amazed. And what I really love, back to what you were saying earlier, Dr. Clifford, about about the man loving the wife in a self-sacrificial way is what I, I read when I when I hear that verse. It says it's that out laying yourself down, like you guys talked about. And it's a and I think as a man, we can either view that as a burden or a blessing. We can either view that as going, okay, this is a burden because oh my gosh, there's so much work for me to do. And I gotta like you, I gotta take care of the Maserati, and I'm just I'm just the model T, I'm good to go. Or we can view it as a calling by God that says nobody else can do what we are called to do. And I, I hope that men see I it. I want to way. jump in there with with mm-hmm. Paul in, in Ephesians 5 when he's he's telling us about loving the wife like Christ loved the church, and he goes on and describes it all, and then he says but you're really just doing yourself a favor. Mm. Why is that? It's because if she feels loved that way, she's going to get turned on and be responsive. And there's nothing that turns on a man more than a turned on woman. So (laughs) he wants her turned on, but he doesn't want to have to do all that to make it happen. (laughs) And so what Paul got that when he said, but you're really just doing yourself a favor when you do that. And we really find that if Mm. we can convince the husband about that we really find it we have a friend who's an editor and we gave him that book to read when we were going to send it to the publisher and he says oh that book made me so mad (laughs) but i know every word of it's true wow (laughs) and here's the reality right the reality is what's the other side what's the other side of the work the other side of that is pornography it's it's transactional sex it's having multiple affairs it's living a man living their life on tinder and having these hookup apps and, and none of it is satisfying. Whereas it's drinking salt water. It makes us more thirsty because what you guys talk about is that God created us as sexual beings, yet sex is only enjoyable in the context of the, of the kind of the rules, if you will, or the barriers or the guardrails of marriage, of, of a relationship. And in that yeah. setting, it's a fantastic. And that's Brandon. why my class that I got right before I got married was so helpful because she connected our sexuality with our spirituality. Mm. And that's one thing we deal with in getting your sex life off to a great start. Most of us don't come into marriage having connected our sexuality with our spirituality. And wow, it's such a beautiful thing when we do. It's so We were talking about what the man's job is, is to get with the woman. The woman has a different job. Her job is to get with herself. Mm. The man will say, well, that's easy. No. (laughs) (laughs) If a woman can get with with her sexuality and and experience her own sexuality and and feel the the tinglings in her body and feel the urgings and the the impulses and all of that and enjoy that rather than shut them down, as she may have practiced for many years, uh, then it it is going to really be what what's end up pleasing to him and to her. But her job, and, and this doesn't quite seem fair, but the man's job is to get with the woman, and the woman's job is to get with herself, and then and she, share it with him, and then he ends up happy, and she ends up happy. Wow, that's really good. That's what lasts a long time. I want to ask um, one more question, um, and this is more so. I'm going to kind of it's a it's a question for the listeners, but also I think it plays into us. You know, because Clint struggled with a porn addiction. He brought that into our marriage bedroom. We're now uh, trying to healthily have a new sex life. Mm-hmm. I sometimes get fearful of switching up new things to, you know, positions, just positions or things like that. Yeah. And because I'm always in my head, I'm thinking, well, you know, is this uh, the only sex ed that we've had, unfortunately, is from porn. And I never want our marriage bed to go back there. I never want it to be defiled, you know. And so I guess my my question to you guys is, you know, what's healthy? How, how can we re-engage and is, is sexual foreplay a bad thing? And is too much sex a bad thing? Where is it kind of like that middle ground? Well, it's okay. That's yeah, that's a great question. And uh, the reason we don't use the word sexual foreplay is, is because we believe all of that is sex. Mm. Mm. And that, that may the, help the, you the, change the that. touching, the caressing, the mm. playing, positions, the stimulating, all of that is part fun. of the sex. So mm. we don't think of that's what you do before you have sex. We think that's part of sex. And, and that's important once you get to be our age, because all the other thing may not work as well, but you still can have fun. 
<laughs> that makes so, a lot of sense too. Yeah. There's probably a whole like, lesson you guys could do that as our as our bodies get older, right? What kind of how do we have healthy sex then? Right. Or even like you you have a four year old, you know, going through pregnancy and childbirth and after childbirth, things have to change. And sometimes there's pain, sometimes there's other issues. And how do you stay sexual without having sex sure. as we defined it in our culture? And so we, getting back to the specifics of your question, um, when it is focused on each other rather than what's in your mind, very often when, when couples have had foreigner infidelity in their past, we encourage you to keep the lights on, keep your eyes open, to look at each talk, other. talk to each other, look at each other. We're talking about staying in the moment. And keeping the oxytocin bonding, this eye-to-eye mm. -eye contact. And we want to end with that when you're getting near the end. So with the eye to eye contact, because that's very. Or important. are we getting near the end here? We are, but I want to. I want to ask. I want to keep really going good. on that. So okay. So um, I again, we're just not our situation. So Charity, I'm assuming that you have felt safe so far in the sexual sexual positions we've had, the sex we've had, which is why it's kind of our go to, yeah. right? And I think what you said earlier, Dr. Clifford, is that the guy. I think there's something about it where. We we like to mix it up, or we we're not we're not the same way every time. And I think is is that normal for guys to say that, or is that yeah, a pornography sure, thing? Yeah. Okay, so that's normal for us guys to want excitement in a new way and to mix it up and things like that. Is that? That's right. But when we can do that, not at the cost to the other person, Especially but because because yeah. it's connecting and mutual, and that's why we talk about keeping our eyes open and, and staying very closely connected. And in, we talk about in, in the book, Enjoy, about the woman leading with her sexuality, because that way, and that's what we would recommend, particularly in your situation, if you lead with the changes and be creative and try new things, you're not going to worry that it's him trying to act out something from his past. And it's a lot easier for the man well, then, to well, get with the he'll, woman. He'll follow. Don't worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> That's the truth. I love right. you said that. We've And we've done that very well, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't pushed anything that I've wanted on you. I've kind of go, okay, let's wait. But I'm, I, you know, I can wait for a long well, time. It, if the woman can can take the lead in it and saying, yeah. okay, what would make me happy? And Listen go after to her that. body. Yeah. That's, that's what we mean by the woman leading yeah. uh, and getting in touch with herself. And the man will never object to that. But also the exercises in restoring the pleasure where you go step by step, that gives you a lot of variety too, yeah. because we take you through all kinds of different ways of caressing and enjoying each other's bodies. Even some stuff that's a little bit weird. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, I cannot wait to hang up on this phone call and then order it in the same second. I mean, it's going to be like, I'm getting it expedited. We're, we're starting this tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Talk to us about the eye to eye contact because I want to end on that. Please yes. elaborate on well, it. One thing, if there would be one thing we want to leave couples with is our formula for intimacy, which again, we developed before sex in the brain research, but it is validated completely. And it's on our website passionatecommitment.com. It's the third <clears throat> item down when you go. And so what's, what's, what we're talking about in this formula for intimacy is 15 minutes a day, one evening a week, uh, one, one day a quarter and one weekend per year. But, but let's talk about the 15 minutes. Yeah. The most important is the 15 minutes per day and you can do it with your four-year-old around it's not a private thing. It's perfect for kids. You can have teenagers around. It's perfect for kids to see that you are connecting with each other in a loving, so physical way. So it starts with, we're right here at our center of our house, which is between our den, as you can see, and our kitchen. And it's like a bar. And that's where we're standing. And this is where we meet often at the end of the day before we have dinner or whatever after dinner and we look can look into each other's eyes because one can be at the other side and one this side and you share there are three things you do in this 15 minutes a day you can set your timer to start with because yeah just a caution there guys can easily feel like oh if we start this 
it's She's not going to end. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 um, and, uh, and so set your timer so that when it goes off after 15 minutes, it's done. Well, and you can even set for each part of this. There are three parts. So the first one is looking into each other's eyes. Because when you look into each other's eyes, your body, your brain produces oxytocin, that counter to the porn. So you build, you start building the intimacy. And if you do this every day, it'll just become automatic. Sometimes and during that time, what you're sharing is any, you're not handling who's going to pick up the dry cleaning. You're handling any thoughts or feelings or reactions or things you appreciated or with of the other one or just something. Anything positive. It's not working out problems and it's not working out your day's plan. It's just sharing something positive. It can be a scripture verse you read it can, well, that goes to the second yeah part. that goes to the second part <laughs> then that but it can be some thought you had you know i can hardly wait till the COVID is over and we can bring friends into our house you sure. know anything positive and then the second part is some kind of spiritual connection and and that varies with where people are in their faith journey sometimes but, it's just holding hands and praying together we've got a lot of books right here that are little flip calendars you know where you or devotional for the day uh, for Thought couples, for the day that for kind couples. of thing. Uh, could be reading a passage, um, preparing for the sermon on Sunday, uh, anything but mm -hmm. just some kind of connection, and then move to the physical part. So, so the emotional connection first, then the spiritual, and then the physical. And that has to start with a full front to front body hug. Set your 20. timer for 20 seconds. And this research shows that after 20 seconds, your body just produces a large surge of oxytocin. And one guy wrote, if you want to get your wife to do anything, just hug her for 20 seconds. Because <laughs> yeah, it builds we're, that we're trust. Not, we're not talking a no. Southern Baptist hug here. We're talking uh, a full body hug. No, a COVID hug with a man. Yes. COVID hugs. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you guys, that wow. is so helpful. And I want our listeners to learn more about that. And, yeah, and get plugged into all that you guys have. So yeah. let's talk real quick about how okay, anybody just anybody hearing this. Just a minute. One thing after the hug. Oh, yo, yeah. oh, sorry. Keep going, uh, please. Yeah. After the hug, then a passionate kiss for the dopamine. See, now we're talking. We can't leave that part out. That's no. and, 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 and the passionate kiss is not designed to lead to sex. It's yeah. designed for its own end. Because the many couples it. over time, and this may be true for you, start kissing less and less because... She thinks when he comes up to her, she thinks, hmm. He wants sex. Do, Why are you nodding your head like that? Why are you nodding your head like that? <laughs> some of your best friends have that, right? <laughs> I know somebody who is going through yeah, that. Yeah. My cousin. <laughs> and then she thinks, oh, I better not lead him on. So then she turns the cheek and they stop kissing passionately. And passionate kissing <laughs> is, a, is a way to keep the pilot light on. Now you're nodding your head. So compassion and kissing is how you do keep a little dopamine spark, even after 57 yeah. years. It's yeah. not the same, but it's still there. But many women aren't ready to kiss passionately, or sometimes the man, until they, they feel the trust of the hug. So that's why mm. the emotional, spiritual mm -hmm. hug, passionate kissing. Okay, okay now to your, yeah. your last question. Wow. How can listeners that's learn more okay. about us? Um, first of all, our, our website is passionatecommitment.com. For the general area of their sexual life, the gift of sex is really good. Mm -hmm. If there are issues that they need to deal with, restoring the pleasure has all the step-by-step -step, uh, plan for read, going through things. Read through and work through. If they're engaged, it's getting their sex life off to a great start. And if if they are ready for it they should read the woman in joy and the man the married guy's guide out loud together and um and sometimes when we're working with people in sex therapy uh virtually now we have them get we always have them get restoring the pleasure but then sometimes we also have them get in joy and married guy's guide because some of those ways those are more about your way of thinking and approaching and affirming and all that whereas the restoring the pleasure has some of that but it's much more step-by-step step. Step step, practical experiential and if people yeah. didn't get all that they can find that on our website passionatecommitment.com and the formula for intimacy is on the home page hey you guys are great this is fun to be together with you yes
Oh my, oh my gosh. Well, thank you for being our therapist. We'll mail yeah. you a check yeah. because there's yeah. some yeah. good stuff. Well, let me give you our address. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, thank you guys so, so much. I can't even, you guys are fun. We, we were so excited to have you guys on and we just feel honored. And I know that our listeners are going to benefit so much from this episode. Yeah. yeah. Thank you guys for being with us today. Okay. Sure thing. Bye-bye. 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 Bye